In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost here in Phoenix, Arizona. The epistle is taken from <coughs> St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Brethren, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, which has been created according to God in justice and holiness of truth. Wherefore, put away lying, and speak the truth, each one with his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry, and sin not, and do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Do not give place to the devil. He who was accustomed to steal, let him steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands at, at, at that which is good, that he may have something to share with him who suffereth need. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 22. At that time Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who made a marriage feast for his son, and he sent his servants to call in those invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatlings are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went off, one to his farm and another to his business, and the rest laid hands laid hold of his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. But when the king heard of it, he was angry, and he sent his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, The marriage feast indeed is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the crossroads, and invite to the marriage feast whomever you shall find. And his servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good and bad. And the marriage feast was filled with guests. <clears throat> now the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how didst thou come in here without a wedding garment? But he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind his feet, his hands and feet, and cast him forth into the darkness outside, where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. So please pray for the seminarians who have entered this year into the seminary of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. There was about ten of them that entered. Some, a couple still might come in from overseas. So that brings us to about fifteen seminarians. So pray for them all. And uh, the classes began last week. And this week we continue with the classes. And uh, Father Pfeiffer... This weekend, he's out on the west coast in the north, Post Falls, Seattle, and Oregon area. So keep us all in your prayers and the seminarians. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Friend, how dost thou come in here without a wedding garment? The wedding garment for the feast, the wedding feast, the wedding feast is the marriage between Christ and his bride, the Catholic Church. That's his bride. His bride are those souls he died for, who are washed in his precious blood through the sacrament of baptism and through the sacrament of confession, where the blood of Christ washes away the sin and restores sanctifying grace in the soul, whereby God, the Holy Trinity, lives in the soul. So the wedding garment is sanctifying grace. And not only sanctifying grace at the level of being, which elevates us to the very life of the Blessed Trinity. And if we die in the state of grace, you will go to heaven. If we don't die in the state of grace, we will go to hell. And to commit, to lose the state of grace, we have to commit mortal sin. We have to turn our back to God and say, I will not obey your commandments. And that's death to the soul. 
Now, St. Teresa of Avila, it's her feast also today. It's October the 15th, 2017. She was a great, great, feisty Spanish girl, a great saint. But she didn't start off all that great. But from her childhood, she understood the value of the state of grace. And our Lord would even show her <coughs> her soul in the state of grace. And she thought it was an angel. She thought it was just something un indescribably beautiful. And our Lord told her, no, my, my, my daughter, that is your soul. Because... We dwell there, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The one God dwells in your soul. And this is what we're supposed to live like, always in the state of grace. And the devil has so constructed the modern politics and economics and the whole internet work with all the filth that's on there and all the, all the, the availability of evil and just the mentality of people brainwashed through the media, Hollywood, and all the propaganda. We have become worse than the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, worse than the days than before the flood. And sin is the cause of all evils. And we, the devil has made it so that living in mortal sin has become the norm. And we have to live always in the state of grace. That is how Christ wants us to live. That's why he came and died on the cross so that we'd live in the state of grace, which is the true happy state of life. Even though you might suffer, even though you might carry many, many crosses, like St. Teresa, we're going to briefly cover her life. <clears throat> Yet, the children of God, when they suffer, it's out of love for God. And our suffering goes to help rescue many other souls from going to hell. Because if you offer your prayers and sacrifices for poor sinners, our Lord and Our Lady pour out that grace to souls who may be on the path to hell, then wins their conversion, snatches them from the claws of the devil. And really, that is the, the, the real war. That is the real fight right now. Satan is sweeping his tail. The dragon is sweeping his tail, dragging as many as he can to the eternal hell fires. And Our Lady and Our Lord are, are doing everything to win souls. But we all have this dangerous thing called free will. And all of us can freely pray for that grace to love our Lord, keep His commandments, and He will give it. But we also have the free will to turn our back to God and break His commandments willfully. And that's death. For us, that's death. So let's look at this beautiful life of St. Teresa briefly. <clears throat> she was born in Avila in Spain in 1515, March 28th. And her, she, had, she had eight brothers and sisters. And at age seven, she, with her brother Rodrigo, they all learned the catechism and she was really enthralled with eternity. She would often think about eternity, how heaven and to see God and all the saints will be forever and ever, the ultimate happiness in heaven. And then she would think also about the eternity of hell, forever and ever, the flames of hell, the fires of hell, the screams of hell, the damned state of the souls, burning in their whole bones, their esophagus, screaming like animals for all eternity. The, the Holy Ghost raises the question, who of you can endure eternal torments? Who of you can endure everlasting fire? So, her and her brother Rodrigo, they were so filled with this desire to see God as children at age seven, that her and her brother decided, let's go. We heard about martyrs in, by the Muslims, let's go. Let's leave our city, let's leave our country, let's go across the strait into northern Africa and we'll die martyrs. This is age seven. So this shows the purity of her heart. And she will always keep that, that desire to see the face of God. So that when she was dying, our Lord, when the Blessed Sacrament was brought to her when she was dying, 
she exclaimed, Oh my Lord, now is the time that we get to see each other. So all her life she wanted to see our Lord. And that we have to pray for, that desire to see the face of the Blessed Trinity. Because that's why we're all made. That's the only reason we're on this earth, is to see and come to see the magnificence of the Most Holy Trinity, who will fill the soul with his, the direct vision of the Trinity, and fill the soul with indescribable joy, which cannot be explained. But we do know we're made for happiness. It's built into us. And everyone, whatever they're doing, robbing a bank, prostitutes, <coughs> divorce, all these sins, people are seeking their happiness, but they're seeking it in the mud. And it will never fill the soul. Never. But only God can fill us. And this beautiful soul of St. Teresa... She had this, and she would never lose it, even though she would grow a little lukewarm. So, Teresa, St. Teresa, she had in her room, as a young girl, a picture of our Savior. Uh, in, in discoursing, having the conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, St. Fotina. And she would often say, to our Lord, Lord, give me of that water that I may not thirst, using the words of the Samaritan woman. Let me give me that water so I may not thirst. Her mother died when she was 14, and this caused her great suffering. And she said these words As soon as I began to understand how great a loss I had sustained, I was very much afflicted. And so I went before an image of our Blessed Lady and begged her with tears that she would be my mother. So her and her brother began reading books, and she got into, into novels, and she said this was very dangerous for her soul. And this is what she describes in her autobiography. These novels and tales did not fail to cool my good desires and were the cause of my failing and sense of falling insensibly into other defects. I was so enchanted that I could not be content if I had not some new story in my hands. <clears throat> so today it's all cell phones and videos. For her it was novels. I began to imitate the fashions, to take delight in being well dressed, to have great care of my hands, and make use of perfumes, and to affect all the vain trimmings which my position in the world allowed. So she started to get worldly, and started to get, uh, we're at age 15. So her father picked up this change in her, and he had her go to a school of the convent of Augustinian nuns in Avila. And there with the girls and under the nuns, she was, uh, she recovered that innocent spirit. And then she fell very sick and she had to leave the convent after a year. And when she was sick, she started reading the letters of St. Jerome. And St. Jerome is, well, just read one of his letters to get an idea. He's just realistic and he says things as they are. And he attacks the heretics, he calls names. Uh, he would not be well loved by many people today because he just calls things as they are. And those letters actually converted her to become a nun. So she would give her life at age 20 to become a sister. She would enter the incarnation convent of the Carmelite nuns just outside of Avila. And she describes leaving her house. She left without telling her father because she knew he would never approve and she loved her father very much and it would break his heart and she said these words I remember that whilst I was going out of my father's house <clears throat> I believe the sharpness of, of, of sense will not be greater in the very instant of or agony of my death than it was then 
There was no such love of God in me at that time as was able to quench that love which I bore to my father and my friends. So she would enter the convent and there she would learn a little bit about mental prayer. But this convent had over a hundred nuns. And this convent was, we would call it, a lax convent. They were not they were not respecting the silence. People were coming into the parlor. Anyone could come and talk to the sisters. Young men were coming and talking to the sisters. And it was very casual. They were joking around with the people. And St. Teresa, as a young nun, she said, I used to spend half the day there. And I put off mental prayer. Now, mental prayer is when you just converse with God, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and to and converse with Him. She put off mental prayer, and this was very dangerous for her. And this went on for a while. And she says when her father died, her confessor, or rather her father's confessor, who was a Dominican priest, pointed out to Sister Teresa the dangerous state that she was in. At his instance, she returned to the practice of private prayer and never again abandoned it. But she had not yet the courage to follow God perfectly or entirely, to renounce dissipating her time and gifts. During all these years of wavering and yet of gradually increasing strength and growing purpose, St. Teresa tells us she never tired of listening to sermons, however bad they were. <laughs> so, you have company here. But in, her, in, her, in prayer, her thoughts were more busied about desiring, in her own words, that the hour resolved to be spent in prayer might come quickly to an end, still listening when the clock would strike, then upon better things. So, in other words, she, she was very lukewarm. And it's in this time that our Lord showed her her place in hell. She was a nun. Our Lord, she said this was the greatest grace God ever gave her. She saw in a vision her place in hell, which was down a, a incandescent burning corridor. And, and in the wall inside a niche full of spikes smaller than her body she would be stuffed in there unable to move for all eternity and many souls who have gone into hell describe this very thing how passing down some of the corridors of hell where some parts are open flames some says saint anthony are frozen in ice hence the gnashing of teeth and some places of hell, there's all different tortures. <clears throat> and the, some of the saints describe passing down some of these corridors of hell. They hear moaning and screaming and blasphemies from behind the wall because there are souls sealed up in those walls forever. And that was her place. And we got to remember also, um, we also have a place in hell if we don't save our soul. And we have to save our soul. None of us could endure this forever. And that's why it's so important to stay close to the Virgin Mary. So what did St. Teresa do? She realized she was more and more convinced of her unworthiness. So she prayed to the two great penitents, St. Mary Magdalene and St. Augustine. Both of them were great sinners before and, and converted. And so she prayed to them, and she read St. Augustine's book, his Confessions. And if you want to read a good book on how to come to learn to pray, read the Confessions of St. Augustine. Powerful book. This converted her also. And she also felt a special grace praying before a picture of St. Mary Magdalene. And she felt this assistance and from that day, she said, I have gone on improving much ever since in my spiritual life. So you see, the intercession of the saints is powerful. And God wants his friends honored. 
And so it's so important to pray, obviously, to our Lord. But our Lord won't always answer our prayers. He will only answer through His Blessed Mother or through some saints. Because He wants His Mother honored and He wants His saints honored. And too bad for the Protestants who, who claim, just go to Jesus, go to Jesus, go to Jesus. But Jesus Himself doesn't answer those prayers. He will not. He refuses because he wants us to go to his mother. He wants us to go to St. Joseph, to St. Philomena, St. Teresa, and other saints. He wants that. And St. Anthony, when you lose something. So she went to these St. Mary Magdalene and St. Augustine, and it really changed her life. So St. Teresa, she <clears throat> continued to strive to go higher. And, and she saw that the convent was, was too worldly. And she heard from her niece one day saying, why don't we start a convent where we just observe the rule of the Carmelites? And St. Teresa took that as an inspiration. And she really took it serious. And she prayed over it. She consulted her spiritual fathers priests, confessors, and she was visited once <clears throat> the, the St. Peter of Alcantara in 1557. He came to visit that convent, the notorious Carmelite convent, and she came to him for confession. And she asked him about this, and, and St. Peter advised her that, that this comes from the Holy Ghost, this reform of the Carmelites. And during this time, God blessed her with many, uh, lifted her in the air in her prayers. She received many consolations, even ecstasies. She saw her angel. She saw our Lord appear to her frequently. And one of the angels appeared to her and struck her heart with a golden arrow. And that her heart today is incorrupt. And it still has the hole that the angel punctured in her heart. It's, it's, you can see it. I've seen her incorrupt heart in, in Spain. And she felt in such an increase of the love of God, and she describes it in her autobiography. I won't read all the details. But she had such a love of God that she said, her words, her famous words were, sometimes I would say to my our Lord with my whole heart, Lord, either to die or to suffer. Either let me suffer or die. I beg no other thing from myself. So she saw the, val the value of suffering, and suffering she would. Because she would later start the reform of the Carmelite convent. Now you would think a nun just starting another convent that would be more austere... Everyone would be happy about this. But no. That she was persecuted by the nuns. She had contradiction by bishops. Contradiction by priests. She was persecuted for, for this. And St. Teresa did succeed finally to start the convent. And she started on the Feast of St. Bartholomew. That's August the 24th. In 1562. And as the, as the convent was being built in 1561, her sister's boy, so her nephew, his son was Gonzalez. The, 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 na the name of the boy was Gonzalez. He was a little child and he used to play along the wall that was being built. And here's what happened the wall fell and crushed little Gonzalez while he was playing and he was carried without giving any signs of life he died and they carried him to, to St. Teresa and she take, took the boy in her arms and she prayed to God and in a few minutes he came back to life in her arms so God blessed her work through these miracles and other graces she received and then other other good saints who knew her soul and knew her intentions 
encouraged her to do this reform of the Carmel. And she would actually succeed. And she was met with opposition from the mayor. The people of the town were uh, raising shouts against this convent. And what these nuns do, they lived in perpetual silence. They lived in austere poverty. They didn't go out begging in the streets. Everything they received was what was brought to them. So St. Joseph would provide for them. And she had a great devotion to St. Joseph. They wore sandals instead of shoes. Hence they're called discalced Car Carmelite nuns. And they were bound themselves to perpetual abstinence. That is, no eating of meat at all. And the Benedictines do that too. So that's a great penance for most people, especially men. But these nuns also. So St. Teresa, eventually, she would spend five years in this happy life before she would start establishing other convents. Altogether, she would establish 17 convents. Now remember, in Germany, during these same years, Luther is smashing Europe and dividing it in half with the Protestant heresy. England is already putting priests to death under Henry VIII, falling to the Lutheran heresies. So our Lord raised up St. Teresa to build convents to replace the monasteries and convents that were being massacred and burnt down and stolen by the Protestants in England and, and in Germany and the Netherlands. But she describes her life, how she grew close, so close to our Lord in this time. And I, was, I visited this convent, <clears throat> and there's a statue of the child Jesus on the staircase. Because one time she was walking up the staircase after breakfast, going up to her cell, and she saw a child standing on the stairs. And the, the child said to her, Who are you? And St. Teresa said, I am Teresa of Jesus, and who are you? And the child smiled and said, I'm Jesus of Teresa. <laughs> and so, so our Lord uh, consoled her many times, but she would suffer very much. And she was accused of all kinds of crazy things. And just think, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre, a bishop just doing his duty as a bishop, was hammered by modernist Rome, hammered by all the modernist bishops. They hated him. They unhur unfurled every, every attack against him, even on his life. There were several att attempts on his life uh, of, of Archbishop Lefebvre. And that's the way it goes. For those who do good, they're going to suffer persecution. And that goes for any of you, just to come to the resistance mass. How many of you have been threatened and accused and etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Lose family, lose friends, just for going to mass of priests who are resisting this destruction of Catholic tradition. And this modernist new change of doctrine in the Society of St. Pius X. Many persecutions for the good. So, she would establish within the within the number of years a convent in Segovia, a convent in Durello. She started the men's monastery, and then St. John of the Cross would also carry on establishing more monasteries for men. And in Salamanca, they 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 obtained this house that was occupied by some students. So they didn't leave it all that clean. And the house was kind of like a haunted house. It, had, it was kind of falling apart. And there were strange noises in the house. You know, broken windows. And, but this is what they took for their convent. That's all they could afford. So her and the other nun that came with her to, to find that house and obtain it, that night they slept on piles of straw. That was their bed for a few days before they could get furniture into the convent, just simple furniture. And this is what is described. St. Teresa asked her, the other nun, what she was looking about at as she was looking around. She said, I was wondering, were I to die here now, what would you do alone with a corpse? 
And St. Teresa admits the remark startled her, for, for though she did not fear dead bodies, they always caused her a pain at her heart. But she only replied to the nun, I will think about that when it happens, sister. For now, let us go to sleep. So, and it's also, this is also recorded in her life. In July of that year, 1570, she had a revelation while at prayer of the martyrdom at sea of Blessed Ignatius Azevedo and his companions of the Society of Jesus, among whom was her own relative, Father Francis Perez Godoy. So she saw in a vision what happened, and, and it was 30 or 40 Jesuit priests who were taking the ship from the Canary Islands to go to South America. And they stopped at the Canary, in the Canary Islands before heading out across the Atlantic Ocean. And they were pursued by Huguenot heretics, a pirate, and they surrounded the ship of the priests. And they took the ship and slaughtered in cold blood all the priests. And they saved the superior Blessed Ignatius last and tortured him and put him to death. So this was the martyrdom uh, of July 1570 of Blessed. And she saw this, and then only a month later did the news arrive to Spain. And the priest, her confessor, realized she was not a fake because she described everything a month before. So that's how long it took for news to spread back then. And then um, many, many crosses in her life in, in trying to re spread and build the convents and spread them. And at one point, there was a novice that left her convent. She was trying to be a nun, and she wasn't meant to be a nun, so she left, and she was very disappointed. So she spread false rumors against St. Teresa and her nuns, and reported them to the Inquisition. And the Inquisition was a very good thing. It was a very good thing. But this uh, disappointed novice falsely accused St. Teresa. So this is also the cross of many who do good works. They, they endure many false accusations. And we've certainly had our share in Kentucky. Also, um, <clears throat> there was raised up a massive campaign to close down the convents of St. Teresa and lock, uh, lock her up and put an end to this. <coughs> And then it took, it took St. Pius V and it took King Philip II to defend her. And King Philip put an end to all the nonsense and he supported her work and backed her up. So finally in 1580, there was the separation of the, dis, the discalced nuns from the calcined nuns. In other words, the lax Carmelites and the, the Carmelites observing the strict order of Elias. So, St. Teresa, she, in 1580, she was by now 65 years old. And she was quite broken in her health. And this is the description of her last hours. Her last convent was setting up a convent in Burgos, northern Spain. So 17 convents by, by 1580 she had established. And then there was one time where our Lord told her he would appear to her scourged. He would tell her, I would create all the universe just to hear from you, my God, I love thee. And St. Thomas tells us the value of an act of love of God. Just to say to God, my God, I love thee. Most sacred Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. He, he, he would make the universe just to hear that from us with a sincere heart. He also told St. Teresa of Avila, I would go through all the passion and the crucifixion just for your soul, if I had to. And he would say that to all of your souls as well. So... Here she is, 65 years old, in 1580, 
1582 she will die. Blessed Anne of St. Bartholomew describes the journey, her last journey. Not properly prepared for, and the founder is so ill, St. Teresa so sick, that she fainted on the road. One night they could not get food but a few figs. And when they arrived at the town of Alba, St. Teresa went straight to bed. She was very sick, and three days later she said to Blessed Anne, At last, my daughter, the hour of death has come. She received the last sacraments from Father Antoni de Heredia, who asked her where she wished to be buried. She only answered, Is it for me to say, Will they deny me, me a little ground for my body here? And when the Blessed Sacrament was brought in, she sat up in bed, helpless though she was, and exclaimed, Oh, my Lord, now is the time that we may see each other. She died in the arms of Blessed Anne at, at nine in the evening, October the 4th, 1582. But the very next day, the Pope had decided to change the calendar to the Gregorian reform. And so 15 days, no, it was 10 days, were dropped from the calendar. This was a massive change in the history of the world. 10 days were just dropped. So she, she died on October the 4th. The next day was October the 15th. 10 days disappeared. And ever since, we've been following this calendar, the Gregorian reform, and it was the Pope to decide that. So, St. Teresa, she's one of those feisty, beautiful souls who just kept persevering and grew in the love of God through amidst all the crosses and tears and thorns. And that's what God, He wants all of you to become saints, all of us. And there's nothing more sad, says Leon Bloy, a Catholic author, than not to be one of the saints. But we all got to fight for this. Heaven does not fall on our laps. We got to fight for it. Heaven is taken by violence, Christ said. And the violence is to ourselves, our pride, our sensuality, our ease, our laziness. We got to overcome this by daily rosary, daily prayer, spiritual reading, keeping the commandments. And keeping strong in the faith with no compromise. No compromise. We must not waver and we must not compromise with the words of Archbishop Lefebvre, one of his last words to the priests. And that's why we are in this position now with Mass in the Hall, because we cannot go along with the compromise with Pope Francis. He has a right to our disobedience because he's destroying the church. And uh, Bishop Fillet, who should know better, is going along with this destruction and swallowing the poison of Vatican II in the new Mass, which is, you can see it signed, the doctrinal declaration. And they always try to excuse it and defend it and say, no, it never happened, it's not true. Well, he signed it, and all the priests have a copy of it in March of 2012. And then sadly, it was really sad to see Bishop, Fillet, or Bishop Williamson crumble also. So these are our days when scarcely the elect shall be saved. These are these days where we really have to stay close to the Virgin Mary and any of us can fall. We have to pray with all our heart to be faithful. So let's ask St. Joseph, let's ask the Mother of God, and today St. Teresa. Let's ask her to give us a little bit of her love of God, a little bit of her feistiness, to persevere to the end, so that when we die, we can say to our Lord, Lord, finally I get to see you. Which joy I, I ask for all of you in this Holy Mass. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.